Hi, and welcome back to Gemma Network Open Live. I'm Seth Truger, Digital Media Editor at Gemma Network Open. And I'm Angel Desai, Gemma Fishbein Fellow. Of course, if you're following along live, be sure to uh, ask us questions or comment at Gemma Network Open on Twitter or respond in the comments uh, below the video on Facebook or YouTube. Um, our first paper we've got today is the Clinical Outcomes of Mortality, Readmissions, and Ischemic Stroke Among Medicare Patients Undergoing Left Atrial Appendage Closure via Implanted Device. And we've got first author Rajesh Cabra with us. Welcome, Dr. Cabra. Thank you very much for having me here. Sure. Glad you could join us and glad. Uh, thank you for, for publishing this great paper. So tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, and uh, what you did here in the study. So I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist. Uh, I'm a faculty at University of Tennessee at Memphis. Uh, this paper was a collaborative effort between the uh, University of Tennessee and uh, uh, the researchers at the University of Iowa. So uh, essentially what we did here was uh, we looked at the Medicare database uh, uh, to see how Watchman device or the left atrial appendage closure device is doing in the real world. Uh, so far we have only limited data outside the clinical research studies. Uh, we wanted to look at the contemporary practice and how do the patients compare to the trial patients, how are the patient outcomes compared to the trial patients. Uh, and uh, we, in, in a cohort of uh, 13, over uh, 13,600 patients with atrial fibrillation, we found that uh, similar to the clinical studies, uh, watch, uh, the left atrial appendage occlusion device was associated with a significant decrease in uh, stroke risk. So I think it has uh, its place in stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation in patients who are not good candidates for long-term anticoagulation. We also found that uh, the mortality uh, was higher compared to research uh, studies over one year. And, uh, and we were not surprised because uh, being Medicare patients, these were older population and they had higher comorbidities. So, so I think those were the most salient findings in our paper. Yeah, and this is a, a really fascinating phenomenon to me. We've talked about it on the on the show here before that the, the patients who are selected in the studies tend to be healthier, fewer comorbidities, fewer right. things like renal failure, et cetera. Right. right. Um, so seeing how things happen in the real world, world is interesting. Um, I think that the main difference, you know, we, as you said, the patients are a few years older. Uh, the Chad's VAS scores are a bit higher as well. Right. Right. More comorbidities like heart failure. Um, and the stroke rate seemed pretty comparable, about 1.9 versus right. 1.6%. Right. But the mortality rate um, seems to be fairly substantially higher at 7.5 right. right. versus 3.6. Right, right. And uh, I think it's a, uh, uh, we already pre-selected an older population here. And, and the research studies, uh, the patients had to be eligible for, uh, to warfarin uh, as well because it, they were mainly randomized studies. But in the real world, most of the patients who get these devices are not patients who would do well on warfarin or other blood thinners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Older patients with multiple right. comorbidities are right. patients who right. in this situation might need the right. anticoagulation the, the most, but right. paradoxically have the highest risk for it. Yeah. Right, right. Um, I was actually just wondering, just to take a step back, as uh -huh. someone that's not a cardiologist uh -huh. um, or not in this sort of realm. Can you actually just explain a little bit about the mechanics behind the left atrial appendage closure with this implanted device? Sure. Um, sort of what it is, how it works, um, and you know, you've already mentioned a little bit about why it's sort of um, selected for some of these populations. But Sure. So uh, patients with atrial fibrillation are at a very high risk of having stroke. And over 90-95% of these uh, clots uh, originate from uh, a small pouch in the left upper chamber called the left atrial appendage. So Watchman device is, a, uh, or left atrial appendage occlusion device is a device uh, which we implant going from the groin. So we go into the femoral veins, uh, go transeptally uh, to the left atrium. Uh, we find uh, where the left atrial appendages uh, with uh, echocardiogram, with uh, uh, angiography, and then this uh, we deploy this collapsible device. It's an umbrella-shaped device which occludes the left atrial appendage so that it is uh, dissociated from rest of the heart. Over time, uh, heart tissue forms over this device, uh, and and we practically occlude the left atrial appendage uh, from 
from the heart so that uh, uh, these patients uh, do not have any further uh, clots there which can migrate to the uh, to to the brain to cause stroke Interesting. Yeah. We, we've got some uh, viewers, uh, Lizette Mora, Javier Jimeno, and uh, Vicky, who joined us. So thanks for joining. We're talking about uh, left atrial appendix closure devices, uh, or left atrial appendage closure via implanted device in right. Medicare patients and the comparisons right. versus the patients uh, who are in the RCTs that approved the device. Um, so I'm curious, with uh, since, since there's the, I guess, the, the overgrowth of the, of the heart tissue over the device, do these patients um, end up on things like antiplatelet therapy or other, uh, anything else to manage it? So the current protocol is, uh, once they get this device, we keep them on warfarin for 45 days, uh, war uh, warfarin and aspirin. And after 45 days, we repeat another uh, transesophageal echocardiogram to make sure that uh, the device is still in place. There are no leaks uh, around the device. And at that point, if everything looks good, we stop warfarin and keep the patients on uh, aspirin and clopidogrel for a total of six months. And at six months, we stop clopidogrel and just leave them on aspirin for rest of their life. Right. And these are generally seem to be, uh, you know, fairly high risk patients for, for right. vascular disease anyway. Right. So I, right. I would bet my nickel there's a good chance a lot of it would be on aspirin anyway. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, and given that this was, as you mentioned before, a mm -hmm. more sort of real life sort of scenario. Right. Um, were you or any of your co-investigators surprised at the results that you ended up finding? Um, Actually, no. Uh, uh, so the uh, we were we were not uh, really surprised, but it was like kind of reassuring to all of us uh, that even in uh, real world, the uh, device is performing uh, pretty good uh, because uh, across all the Schatzvas score, uh, we saw a significant decline in stroke risk. Uh, uh, we were surprised with the mortality rate, but then there is precedence. There are a couple of other uh, smaller uh, real-world studies. One of them is Evolution, which was from Europe, which in fact had a higher rate than uh, what we uh, found. Uh, they, they had a, a mortality rate of 9.8%. So, so I think uh, I, 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 it, it was kind of uh, uh, reassuring uh, with the outcomes we had that we are indeed doing the right thing for these patients. Okay. And uh, there's a question from uh, Ilya Seleznev. Uh, what are the major complications from the device that we've found? So, uh, so again, these are Medicare uh, uh, outcome data. So all we can look at is mortality and we can look at hospitalizations. So we, uh, uh, so we, we already talked about uh, mortality. In terms of hospitalizations, uh, we kind of looked up uh, the reasons why these patients were admitted to the uh, hospital and they uh, they were for heart failure exacerbation uh, and uh, some patients were admitted for bleeding so it was kind of a whole variety of re uh, reasons and most of them were not related to the device but to other comorbidities but but to answer the uh, the other question what are ge the general complications of this device uh, so the, the main complication which we all are uh, wary of is uh, uh, intraoperatively, there's risk of stroke, there's a risk of uh, um, pericardial tamponade or uh, bleeding around the heart. Uh, those are the main ones uh, acutely. Okay, interesting. All right, we've also got uh, Prince who's joined us, and uh, we're just wrapping up. This is, again, this is a great study. I always love seeing the real world follow up because, you know, we know how idealized RCT situations can be. Um, so thank you for the great work. Appreciate Good. it. Thank you very much. Great. Bye. Take care. All right, well, we're going to move on to the table of contents rundown. Angel, why don't you start us off? All right, so this is epidemiologic trends in cl clostridioides, difficile infections in a regional community hospital network. Um, so this was uh, attempting to look at trends in the incidence of healthcare um, associated as well as community acquired uh, C. diff, I'll say, <laughs> we'll try to say that again, uh, infection among hospitalized patients. They looked at time period from 2013 to 2017. It was a multi-center cohort study um, using 43 regional community hospitals in southeastern, uh, in the southeastern part of the U.S. It's a lot of different um, centers. They ended up finding 21,000, a little more than 21,000 cases of C. diff. Um, and if you look at figure 2C, I think you can see this, um, they found that 
the overall incidence of healthcare facility or healthcare associated uh, C. diff infections have actually gone down over time over this time. But they didn't have enough evidence to really uh, assess that one way or the other in community acquired infection. Um, although they did see, and this is what's in the in the figure uh, or is demonstrated really well in the figure, is that the median proportion of community acquired infections. Um, does seem to be going up, although this finding was not significant. Um, so sort of interesting, I think. Um, I think we're learning a lot more about C. diff. Um, and you know, pr previously, I think when we were first seeing a lot of cases, um, it was sort of relegated to a ho nosocomial hospital-acquired infection. But we're seeing more and more that this is this is um, an issue as well in the community. Right. Yeah. And that, that's one of the things I know when, when I was in med school, we certainly considered C. diff pretty much a complication of medical care, a complication yeah. of hospitalization. Um, uh, also want to welcome Steve Reno, who's joined us. Thanks for talking about C. diff, everyone's favorite hospital acquired infection. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and, it, and it's been fascinating where now just we know, you, I think we still talk about it like it's primarily hospital mm -hmm. associated, but there there is, you know, the the risks of patients, you know, basically any patient in the community getting it is non-trivial anymore. Right. Um, and they had talked a little bit about the NAP1 strain that I guess was one of the first things mm -hmm. that we that we uh, came to know about it as far as um, the hospital epi. And, you know, if you know much more about this than I do from the ID side of things, you know, I think we, we're thinking now about um, uh, MRSA uh, yeah. as community acquired versus hospital acquired yeah. as two really kind of different biologic strains, not just two different epidemiologies. Is that the same with C. diff? Are they two different bugs? Or um, is it just this is one we have a test for and we don't really know. That's a good question, actually. <laughs> I don't know if I can answer that. That's all right. <laughs> um, my sense is that, uh, well, so in here they write, they looked at the rates of NAP1 right. strains and mm -hmm. NAP1 is basically, uh, these were fluoroquinolone resistant strains and these are what mm -hmm. actually triggered the multiple nosocomial epidemics right. that were occurring in the early 2000s. Um, and so they did find that there was actually, there that this strain is also present in the community, okay. but um, that there hasn't really been a change in the incidence over time. So, mm -hmm. you know, what that sort of proportion is, I don't, I don't know if I can tell okay. you. That's right. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, That's, not at no, all. It's nice not to have your general knowledge on this. Yeah. 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 Um, and yeah. I mean, the only other thing to note is that it's no longer Clostridium difficile. It's yeah. Clostridioides. Yeah, exactly. And that a was a taxonomy change in 2016. Um, right. So it's always good to keep up on that. Yeah, it's always it's always difficult when they change the names of yeah. things like this. Like uh, uh, I I do find it I do like it when the abbreviations stay the same, so we can right. still call it C diff. Like with uh, PCP pneumonia, it's now it's uh, when we change it to pneumocystis gerevici or gerevici. Yeah, we can still call it pneumocystis pneumonia. Right. So it's still PCP. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so changing gears a bit, um, there's an a interesting study, the Tempo Diet RCT. It's the type of energy manipulation for promoting optimum, that spells out tempo, metabolic health and body composition and obesity RCT. Um, this is a one-year single center study in the, uh, the Sydney area in Australia um, where they randomized people to two different types of um, diet. The first was a, a moderate energy restriction, so one year of eating a food-based diet, 25 to 35% fewer calories mm -hmm. um, versus um, severe energy energy restriction where for the first four months they did severe energy restriction of 65 to 75 percent yeah. energy restriction with total meal replacement so shakes and those kind of things they had a specific program I believe it was a commercial program and then the rest of the eight months mm -hmm. um, the same moderate uh, food-based diet moderate energy restriction food-based diet um, there were 101 women uh, mean age of 58 with a mean BMI of 34 they found a 6.6 kilogram more weight loss in the yeah. intervention group so this the, the women with severe energy restriction at one year 6.6 is what almost 15 pounds mm -hmm. um, that's pretty impressive yeah. um, the downside is that there were higher rates of hip bone mineral density loss the other thing that I thought was really interesting um, was that the more severely restricted group were actually more likely to stay in the trial right? yeah which is fascinating <laughs> yeah I, I mentioned before my wife's a dietitian I am very much not um, I know a little bit but not much at all about the data, but uh, you know, I think the mantra I usually hear is the diet that is best is the one that works for you, yeah. the one that you can do. Yeah, I like that. Um, yeah. And and it, this is, I was again really impressed. That, and this <laughs> is one year. I mean, most I know. one year follow up with this kind of weight loss is really impressive. Yeah, especially I, not eating food. No, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yes. All right.
All right, so next up we have um, an assessment of caregiver targeted interventions for use of motor vehicle passenger sa safety systems for children. This is a nice systematic review and analysis. Uh, they looked at 10 different studies, they looked at interventions to basically target parents uh, of young kids about how to use child restraint systems, et cetera. They had all sorts of different um, interventions across the board, things like community capacity building, awareness, um, education checks up, free personalized education, recommendations on appropriate car seats, fitting uh, free seat installations and fitting stations. Um, which to me is the one that resonated the most because my wife and I used to fight all the time. Like we mm -hmm. had to stop talking about how to install the car seat because, or, or couldn't do it together because it was just, it's so difficult to do. Yeah. Um, one of the studies I found was really interesting. They compared free seats yeah. was, with education on it was more effective than a nutrition and food safety info. Right. I don't know why. <laughs> Which is, um, uh, it's good to know that teaching people yeah. about food doesn't help them install free car seats. <laughs> Um, but anyway, overall, the odds ratio was uh, 0.5 um, um, of self of mostly self-report, um, not riding in the child restraint system. So basically, parents reported after these interventions about a half a, half as much risk of the kids not complying. So all sorts of limitations here. Yeah. Um, you know, they say that that we need more information on things like uh, what are the actual interventions that that are the most efficacious that that work the best. Things like a lot of these were single point in time and not mm -hmm. longitudinal. I, you know, I was actually impressed that they were able to do this because it, the interventions are so different. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they do note that um, a lot of these studies are included right. are at high risk for bias. Right. Um, so just to have this sort of as a base to go from is pretty impressive. Right. And what's interesting is uh, uh, the, the, even though there's a high risk of bias, there's low rates mm -hmm. of publication bias yeah. here, um, which is always good to see in systematic reviews. Definitely. Um, so always good stuff. All right. Next up, switching gears yet again. Uh, um, this this group looked at uh, switching to high deductible health plans and discontinuation of type 2 diabetes uh, treatments, primarily the oral med. They excluded insulin. Um, they did a really good setup where they looked, um, they were using, it was the, the, the Truven market scan database. They only looked at people who had employee sponsored insurance and their job switched from a non high deductible plan to a plan uh, to only having a plan that was high deductible. They used the IRS definition at the time of a deductible of $12. Hundred fifty dollars for an individual or two thousand five hundred for a family, um, but basically there's so much selection here. Oh no, wait, there's a question. I'm sorry. Um, for the restricted group, did they maintain their weight loss? From Emily Link. So Emily, yes, they um, uh, they did maintain weight loss. They had followed but one year yeah. from the uh, I believe it was from the inception of the study. Yeah. Um, not after the one year intervention, but the uh, basically four four months of intense therapy and then eight months of moderate there of moderate. Um, uh, calorie restriction, they did maintain there. I don't think we had longer follow up data. We didn't, and yeah. I think they even mentioned that, yeah. you know, it's because it's always hard after, a, you know, for longer periods of time to be able to really maintain that. Yeah. So. But that's still one year, one year that's data. Pretty good. Is, it's still pretty good. That's better than, that's better than a lot of weight loss yeah. studies. I wish you're usually on the order of weeks from the ones that I've seen, but again, I'm not an expert. On this <laughs> one. Uh, so, anyway, switching back, high deductible health plan. So, it's nice because there's so many different things where if you know you're going to be using a lot of healthcare, or health services are probably less likely to have a high deductible plan. So these are people who are, as best we can tell from an administrative database, essentially kind of shoehorned into the high deductible plan. Mm -hmm. um, and they had about 3,000 patients. Uh, the good news is there was no overall differences in refill changes or discontinuations of medications, but there was difference in, in the use of branded medications, mm -hmm. um, which you can see in figure in the figure. <laughs> um, so basically, all A is all anti-hyperglycemic medications. Um, C is the generics, but but if you look, there's a crossover in the high deductible plans versus non high deductible plans, um, and people people um, were discontinuing their branded ones, um, which in some ways is bad uh, mm -hmm. because people there there's uh, transition, there's there's always opportunities for people to lose uh, their care completely uh, at, at these kind of transitions. Um, but it's also this this shows I, I I think the economists are always happy about the stuff that people respond to things like increased out of pocket costs. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, I think we've seen a few of these studies that use things like the market scan database. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk a little bit about what that is? And yeah, so the market scan, Truven market scan database, it's a proprietary database that this company runs um, that basically, uh, I don't know exactly how they got the data off the top of yeah. their head, um, and I think there's a couple different permutations, but they basically get reports of um, when pharmacies charge insurance companies mm -hmm. uh, so that you can actually see when people are essentially filling their medications indirectly because cash is changing hands. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry I put you on the spot. No, no, no. That's okay. I should know better because I worked on a paper using Truven a while ago. Um, 
Uh, we've also got a couple more viewers, Siva B and Doker Nick. Welcome. We are in our table of contents rundown. And Angel, what is next? Um, let's see. I think I'm a little out of order here. Okay, perfect. Effectiveness of universal school-based screening versus targeted screening for major depressive disorder among adolescents. So this is a trial protocol for a forthcoming um, randomized clinical trial with the objective of trying to see what the effectiveness of a universal school-based screening for adolescent major depressive disorder um, is versus targeted screening, which right now is sort of the, the standard of care. You know, if you see somebody, or if somebody seems to be um, exhibiting symptoms that are concerning for major depressive disorder, then you sort of target them for um, screening. And so what this uh, study will be aiming to do is, um, it's called SHIELD, which I love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so they're going to be doing an RCT. It's in eight Pennsylvania public schools, public high schools, so ninth to, through twelfth grade. They're randomizing by grade um, to either getting universal screening versus this targeted screening. Um, the screening is occurring, the universal screening is occurring through the PHQ-9 questionnaire. Mm -hmm. And the primary outcome of this study is going to be looking at the proportion of adolescents who are ultimately referred to um, what they refer to as a student assistance program um, for uh, mental health issues um, and, and also what that engagement is uh, further down the road. And so I believe that they're aiming to complete all of the questionnaires by December of 2019, so soon. That's, that's soon. That's good. Um, so hopefully we'll see those results forthcoming. Okay, great. We've got another viewer, Jeff Blitz. Welcome. Uh, we are talking about the SHIELD RCT, which is great in a lot of different ways, um, you know, really trying to identify mental health problems um, mm -hmm. and people who can benefit from further mental health services in high schools, uh, which is wonderful. Plus, I not only, there's there's so many great things about the acronym, not only does it spell SHIELD, right. the yeah. cardiologists are well ahead of us all on the <laughs> acronyms. Um, welcome, Andrea. Rivola, we're um, toward the end of our table of contents rundown. What's next? Um, so we have advanced care planning claims and healthcare utilization among seriously ill patients near the end of life. Um, so this is a retrospective cohort study from 2015 to 2018. Um, they're using a national commercial insurance claims database. Um, they got data from over 18,000 individuals, seriously ill individuals, and they were really trying to look at the association between build advanced care planning encounters and subsequent health care utilization among seriously ill patients. And I think this topic is um, a pretty hot topic right mm -hmm. now, um, just thinking about end of care life, um, uh, end of care, end, end of, of life, life care. care. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> It's a hard one. <laughs> um, and sort of uh, what goes on in terms of the U.S. healthcare system. So what they found is that almost 5% um, of all of the seriously ill patients that were in this database um, had billed advanced care planning encounters. Um, if you look at figure two, this shows the outcomes um, of the study. And they, show, they found that those with these billed uh, advanced care planning encounters were more likely to um, actually be hospitalized, but they were less likely to receive intensive therapy, um, and that they also had a higher likelihood of being enrolled in hospice. Um, now, there were some concerns for residual confounding, and I think if you look at, um, I believe it was their table one, um, you can see that there's certainly differences among um, among the, the patients that had these advanced care planning encounters. They tended to be sicker and, um, you know, had higher severity of illness, et cetera. But um, still, I think, uh, kind of an interesting look into this issue. Yeah, and I, I mean, this is really great work, and it's interesting. I think for me, the the one of the... the I guess questions I have is is it's so hard to tell from from this these kind of data uh, where people are exactly you know mm -hmm. they did a great job I think of, of picking people who on paper have a two year um, life expectancy yeah. um, or close to the end of life um, and so is it uh, but you know it, it, there's just that like that special sauce that clinicians have are are docs more likely to have conversation with people who we know in ways you can't tell from these kind of uh, you know black or white data mm -hmm. um, are close to the end of life yeah absolutely. Yeah, and the um, the invited commentary made a couple really good points too. That you know, just because we're spending more toward the end of life and mm -hmm. with certain patients, or you know, are we actually being more respectful of certain wishes? Mm -hmm. um, were these patients, because of the advanced care planning, um, did they do a better job of picking what interventions they were getting and mm -hmm. not getting um, that other patients may not have? Um, so it's interesting stuff. This stuff's not black and white. It's kind of like um, there was a paper I read recently that was looking at. Uh, I think it was one of the coordinated care papers we did, mm -hmm. and they did a good description of how um, they tried to do, you know, all, all these special touch points to get chronic mm -hmm. care patients yeah. um, to not have to, you know, get acute care. Right. Um, and they ended up just finding all these extra acute care needs. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> um, so, so the fact that, you know, it's just less money, less dollars, less in invasive care isn't necessarily always a good cause. It's, you know, right-sizing the care. Yeah. I, guess. I don't know. 
Were you surprised that uh, only about 5% of all of these seriously ill patients had any sort of advanced care planning encounters? It's pretty small. Yeah, sadly, I am not surprised. Yeah. Um, it's. I feel like for patients who are, I don't know, have these kind of comorbidities that I see, um, we're, um, I'm continually happy with how much advanced care planning has mm -hmm. been done. At least the discussion has been broached or people have um, uh, at least designated um, a surrogate who can make decisions for them when they can't, yeah. um, which to me is the is the easiest low-hanging fruit because we don't know exactly what's going to happen down the road. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, it's 5% is so low. Yeah. That's, uh, I'm an optimist. There's lots of room for improvement. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Something to continue to strive towards. Yeah. So. All right. So we got one more? Yes. Um, so this is a research letter. Uh, newspaper adherence to media reporting guidelines for the suicide deaths of Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain. So this is really interesting. Um, apparently, there have been some studies which have demonstrated that news media coverage of suicide is actually associated with an increased risk of subsequent suicides. Mm -hmm. um, and the strongest association that's been documented um, is following when uh, following newspaper reporting of celebrity suicides. Hmm. And so in 2001, there were actually media guidelines that were established to try to curb this. Um, and so this study actually wanted to see um, whether or not newspapers were adhering to those reporting guidelines. And they specifically kind of used the cases of uh, Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain. And I think part of that was um, not only just sort of the time, you know, the timeliness of it, but there had been some discussion or controversy or criticism of um, how Kate Spade's um, suicide was portrayed in mm -hmm. in the media. And Anthony Bourdain's, I think, followed shortly after. Yeah, or it was just like was, four days apart. Yeah, like exactly. Exactly. So um, these investigators looked at uh, newspapers from all over the U.S., from all sort of four regions. Um, and they had a pretty good Cohen's Kappa interrater agreement. It was 0.893, so pretty good. Um, and they found, so apparently that there are 14 guidelines. Um, so they found that and on average, the mean um, sort of guidelines that were adhered to was at around seven, so about mm -hmm. half. Um, but that newspapers were more adherent in reporting uh, or adhering to those guidelines for the reporting of Anthony Bourdain's suicide as compared to Kate Spade's suicide. And um, they, uh, they do speculate that this may actually have been a result of the criticism that came following Kate Spade's suicide. Although the two came so close together, I'm right. not really sure. Right. And also they mentioned that in 2014 around Robin Williams' death by suicide, the rates were much higher yeah. as far as, so it, it didn't really, I don't know, it's it's mixed messages. Right, <laughs> um, exactly. But yeah, it's also, it's. I feel like whenever you look at, uh, let's look at these 14 things and mm -hmm. how many were hit, uh, the numbers are always, I think, uh, Less appealing than we want them to be. Yeah. Um, but if you actually look down, look down the list, it, it's pretty good. And Figure Two shows shows the ratios pretty well. Um, you know, things like uh, all of the articles that they covered avoided referring to suicide as a growing problem, epidemic, or skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. um, they almost all of them uh, used used a non -sation, non sensational headline. Um, and used photos that focus on the individual's life versus death. Uh, used better language, like died by suicide rather than committed suicide. Mm -hmm. um, didn't report uh, specific details about notes and things like that. Um, which is, which is, I mean, again, there's stuff across the board, and I'm sure all these elements are important. I'm yeah. obviously not an expert in this, yeah. um, but it's 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 good to see. I don't know, like even even though the top level numbers are a little, de uh, I don't know. Less and less good than I would hope they would be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's overall still so pretty good, and 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 even if the lesson is uh, in that period of four days, newspapers can learn. Um, all else, the flip side might also be uh, certain things about you know how different people, uh, different celebrities are treated by the media, which is a whole different right topic. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, well, we're gonna uh, welcome Jamal Saeed uh, who joined us uh, right as we're closing up. So of course, uh, check out the podcast with the author interview is available on iTunes, Stitcher, or all the other places you can get podcasts. Um, join us uh, next week, Tuesday, 3 p.m. Central Time. Um, we will discuss a whole bunch more papers uh, from this week's release, which was coming out tomorrow and Friday, 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, and follow us on all the usual social media channels, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Pinterest. Uh, I think we have an Instagram, Instagram now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, we do not have a Reddit, and we're not going to anytime soon. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for joining us. Take care. Great.